there. Welcome to Gaining Vision. I'm Melanie. Thanks so much for clicking. To my returning subscribers, thank you for your continuous love and support. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Please feel at home. Have you had an opportunity to subscribe to the channel yet? If not, take a second, hit subscribe, and please don't forget to like and share. I was shocked, guys. I'll be honest. You know, I love doing all this research. I'm trying to educate myself on Africa. But I came across an interview with Dr. Ericana, and wow, first of all, she's such a good speaker, and I listened intently to everything she had to say. But I was educated in this very short interview. She shared so many really great nuggets about the history of Africa, and I was educated about how we all knew it was colonized years ago, centuries ago. But did you know that there are still 14 countries in Africa that still have connections, almost like colonization? The Francophone countries. Because of one particular agreement that they would make the African heads of state sign when they were receiving their independence. It was a horrible, continues to be a horrible document that sadly it has been allowed to continue to this very day to the serious detriment of the Africans. So I set out to educate the Africans about France. Others would say, why didn't you talk about the British and all other colonizers? Yes, we would speak about them as well. But the root, the one that is leading the pack, the one that is taking the crown of the abuse and exploitation, it is France. And I felt very strongly that if France can come to the table and, uh, and uh, also uh, renegotiate those contracts, if France can leave Africa, that would be the beginning of true liberation and I'm talking economic liberation of the African continent. So France is leading the pack because of its deep roots within Africa, because of the uh, agreements that they, the heads of states were made to sign during independence of Africa. Yeah, by that document, I, I know you were referring to the pact on the continued uh, colonization. I, I, I think you've made reference to it in quite a number of your speeches, the continued colonization of African states. Is that it? That's correct, yes. That continues to be in place today. And through that document, uh, African countries, the former French colonies, uh, upwards, it used to be 85% of, the, of their bank reserves had to be deposited with the French Treasury. It's now down to around 50 to 60%. To this day, poor countries are sending their bank reserves to France. To this day, poor countries, the first right of refusal of all, of all contracts, public, private, large, small, French companies, the first right of refusal. To this day, all minerals discovered yet to be discovered, France has the first right of ref refusal. To this day, those former French colonies, all their uh, mi military must be trained by France. All their military equipment must be purchased from France. And France has a presence in their countries and can invade those countries without notice should they feel the French interests are being violated. So at every level, the document is horrible and it remains in place today. I was horrified when I began to see the extent to which people simply did not know. So I made that my mission number one. Because as a medical doctor, if you're dealing with, uh, with, a, with let's say, an accident situation, you first uh, assess uh, the heart. Does the patient have a heartbeat? Is the patient breathing? You don't worry about the broken bone. You don't worry about other peripheral damages. You start with the core. If the patient is breathing, if the patient has a heartbeat, you must revive them, get a heartbeat, get the lungs, get them breathing, and then you can deal with the other peripheral issues. So I felt the heartbeat of what was ailing Africa started with France. If we can deal with what France is doing in Africa, dealing with the rest of the colonizers will be easy, for their roots are not as entrenched into Africa as the French roots to this day. That still have a treaty with France. I was surprised to learn that in fact, they have such a hold on these African countries still that 85% of their bank reserves have to be invested in France. Yes, it's as if they're paying France for some debt they owe when truly they shouldn't be. The worst part about it is France doesn't have to tell the countries where the money is being invested and what the returns are. So really they're giving them all their money and basically scraping by. 
I was shocked at this. New colonization of African minds and even our literature and how all of this seeps very deep. I mean, Things Fall Apart is continues to be, uh, you know, quite a literary work that everyone refers to. Um, but some people say, you know, we talk about root causes and immediate causes. Uh, what share, if you were to distribute, uh, say, causes uh, i don't want to say blames but if you were to yeah maybe i should use that word blame if you were to distribute blame um, along root causes and immediate causes of where africa currently is unable to fully achieve her potential how will you distribute the blame i'm going to start with of course uh the uh the mind which of, is where at the end of the day that is where the problem really is the legacy of colonization remains to be a serious issue for the African. It is the legacy of colonization that makes it difficult for us as a people to push back. Let me give a very simplistic example, and I use simplistic examples because I want people to really understand what's going on. Using the example of Niger, there is a mutiny in the school cafeteria. The students are sick and tired of a bully who's been taking their lunch for centuries. Finally, finally, they've garnered enough courage. They now have enough knowledge to understand, and they're ready to stand up and push back against the bully. The question then becomes, why has it taken the student so long to, to stand up and push the bully back? It's both because the students have been made to believe that you are inferior. The students have been threatened. The students believe that they are not as good as the bully. The headmaster, some have been smart enough and have tried to push back, guess what? They were assassinated. But finally, the students now have enough knowledge. Question is, why has it taken this long for the students to have enough courage? But be it as it may, the legacy of slavery, the legacy of colonization left the African in a feeling inferior feeling they're incapable, admiring everything else that somebody else is doing, that everything African is undesirable, that we're always looking to what those who don't look like us are doing, and we want to emulate what they are doing. Okay. That, to me, the biggest risk to Africa's development is the mind. But again, I love being educated. She shared so much vital information to help re-educate those of us in the West. She dispelled the myths and misconceptions about Africa, and she talked about how resilient African people are and the successes of Africa. Obviously, she talked about some of the struggles, but how they're overcoming them and how Africa can move forward. The important piece that I learned most of all from this amazing interview was how colonization still has an impact in Africa today, and the West still takes advantage of Africa. I just wanted, you know, to focus on that particular question. If you were to distribute, and I'm not going to, you know, take away from the fact that you've said, you know, the mind is where we need to start from. But if you were to distribute it in terms of, you know, a portion in blames to the root cause and the immediate cause, because people have also pointed at how it is that Africans themselves are conducting themselves and, you know, do not seem to have sufficient compassion for the people as African leaders, do not have sufficient compassion for the people that they lead. Um, where, how would you distribute this particular blame? Would you say 50% to root causes, 50% to immediate causes? In what proportion would you share it? I would say the biggest problem right now is the mind. I still believe it is the mind. Secondly, the average African leader is fighting with their hands tied behind their back, and in some cases also blindfolded. Um, I really don't want us to get lost in the mud about peripheral issues. Remember what I said, you get into an accident situation, first you are said the heartbeat, does the patient have a pulse? Is the patient breathing? We worry about the blown up eye, we worry about the broken bone later. We must go to the root causes. If a president of a country, my daughter, let me take you, you become the president of Nigeria today. With all good intentions, you are told, do not talk about your military, because we got that under our control as France. Do not talk about your financial resources. We control your central bank. We manage your, your, your financial uh, policies. Do not talk about your finances. We have that under our control. Do not talk about your natural resources. Those belong to us. All your contracts, we shall choose and decide who builds your country. 
Now, if you stay away from all that, you are not free to run your country. What do you have? You've given up your natural resources. You've given up control of your financial resources. You've given up control of your military. What kind of a leader are you? I don't care what intentions you have. I don't care how Pan-African you are. I don't care how smart you are. Your hands are tied behind your back and you're blindfolded and you're supposed to engage in a fight and win. How? So I'm saying, before we even talk about how good a leader you are, I can tell you, I was joking with a friend. I said, I'm pretty sure right now, President Bazoon is probably happy. Because what kind of country was he leading? He had no power. He had nothing to control. That's a joke of a leadership. So once we understand that, we can go back and say, okay, fine. With whatever you were given, what have you done with it? Now I'm ready to start putting blame on the leader to say, okay, you were you had a small budget for uh, for for healthcare. What did you do? Did you at least build one hospital during that year? Now, if it's a foreign minister, uh, a minister of health, who is now failing to do something with that budget for one year, that's why we start putting the blame on local levels to say, yes, as a minister of health. You were given a budget. Show us at least one health hospital you built this year. Show us what you have done. So yes, we do have our own leadership issues. Leadership within very limited uh, spaces. And even in those countries that are not former French colonies, we still have major presence and control by the multinationals who existed during colonization. They just went low, but they're still, by and large, running African countries. They're the ones who are the major employers, and they can manipulate the, uh, the politics because of their presence within the country. They can gang up against the country and decide suddenly 10 of them, 15 of them, can leave the country, taking away with them hundreds and thousands of jobs. So they still have some soft ways underhanded ways of dealing and upsetting African economies. It still goes back to the former colonizers. So as we talk about our issues in Africa, let's not look at them in isolation. Let's understand in a holistic way all the issues that are coming to play when we end up with millions of youth unemployed. Why? understand the entire process. Millions of children going to bed on an empty stomach. Millions of children dying. Women dying while giving birth to another life. Let's understand the entire genesis of what is going on. Because the tendency is for us to be pigeonholed and follow, and follow into this rabbit hole of a tiny little issue without understanding the genesis of that issue. And that is the holistic approach that I want the new African to have, to fully have a depth of understanding of what is going on. So we know when we are fighting, is it a fight that is local, that goes to my to my house? Is this my village fight? Is it my providential, uh, pr uh, province, uh, provincial uh, fight? Is it a country fight? Is it a sub African sub-regional fight? Or is it a continental fight? At every level, there are certain tools in our toolbox that we need to pull out. But to think you can take a village issue and apply it to a continental issue, that is stupid, that is ignorant, and we want our people to be politically mature and understand what fight this is, where we call for unity at the village level, unity at the national level, unity at the party level, unity at the continental level. So your question is a very difficult one to answer. My key point is to say, at what level is this fight? Yeah. If it is a village fight, I can tell you how to apportion the blame. If it is a provincial level, if it is a national level, it is a continental level. It depends at what level this fight is all about as if they have a right. Although colonization happened centuries ago, that was the past. We have to allow Africa to prosper as their own countries and continent because truly they're the ones with all the mineral resources and all of the beautiful landscape, people, and let them prosper. The West has to back out of it and stay out of it. Thank you, Dr. Eric Hanna, for educating me and for this amazing interview. I encourage you all to take a listen. It's very informative. You may already know a lot of it, but to me it's something new each and every time I listen to somebody's perspective. I encourage us all to continuously do our research, educate ourselves. If you're not familiar with Africa or the history of Africa, I encourage you to take time, educate yourself as I am doing. And please, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button, and don't forget to share, share, share. Until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.